Hey, I'm Carly Ray, and this is Book Hour with Kelly Bowen. Hi there, I'm Kelly Bowen, author of The Paris Apartment, and I'm here today with Hey, It's Carly Ray. Welcome, Kelly. I'm so excited to have you on Hey, It's Carly Ray Book Hour, and I cannot wait to hear more of your story and about The Paris Apartment out now. I've always been a voracious reader for as long as I can remember. When I was a kid, I loved series like Trixie Belden and Nancy Drew, and I still have the entire Anna Green Gables series. I also inhaled books like The Castle of Adventure by Enid Blyton, and I was, and still am, a huge horse lover, so series like The Black Stallion and Misty of Chincoteague were read over and over again. As a kid, I loved reading historical set books, probably in the beginning because there was horses in them, but as I got older, history and historical fiction is definitely a genre that I continue to gravitate towards. As an adult, I read pretty much anything and everything, though I definitely have a tendency to pick up historical fiction most often. In the last decade, I find myself reading memoirs quite often. Uh, seeing history through the eyes of the individual who experienced it is always a worthwhile read. I never considered writing as a career when I was young. My future ambitions tended to alternate between veterinarian and zookeeper. And in the end, I completed a master's degree in veterinary physiology and endocrinology and worked for many happy years as a research scientist in the agricultural industry. I didn't start writing for real until after I had my first child. When I was home with my firstborn, I started writing as a way to keep my mind engaged, and it was something that I could do at very weird hours, which was a blessing when you were living with a tiny new human who maintained very weird hours. Uh, I ended up writing an entire novel during that time, uh, set during the Second Crusade, which will never see the light again because even then I could objectively recognize the flaws and cliches that it contained. So after that I wrote three more novels set in different periods of history, which I think got a little better each time. By the time I'd finished my fourth book, set in 17th century New France, I considered the possibility that it might not be so terrible. But I couldn't really ask my friends or my mom to critique something like that and expect direct, unvarnished feedback. So I entered the story into a writing contest held by a chapter of the Romance Writers of America, where for an entry fee, you were provided with comments from five judges, all published authors or agents. So something offering invaluable criticism. Uh, long story short, my agent, uh, which was my agent at the time, happened to read my entry and contacted me. She liked my voice, she liked the story, uh, and then she asked if I had written anything that she might actually be able to sell in a competitive marketplace. I did not have anything that she could sell at that time, as it turned out. Uh, nothing what publishers were looking for at that particular time, but that was okay because I told her I could write one. And so I took her very good advice and her offer of representation, wrote the first novel and a synopsis for two more in a series of three, and that is what she sold on my behalf. 15 books later, uh, my agent is still giving me very excellent advice. My stories are almost always inspired by real history, and my heroines across my books are inspired by real life heroines from the history books as well. Writing about extraordinary women doing extraordinary things, no matter the genre or the period setting, has always been something I'm passionate about, and there is no end to inspiration. There are so many incredible women whose stories are hidden in history, and crafting characters based on them is my way of making them come to life. I do try to visit the places I write about. Because I write in a historical context, often the places look far, far different than they once did. So to be as accurate as possible, I rely on old drawings, maps or photos if they're available, uh, descriptions that can be found in old texts, letters, memoirs, um, Documentaries using real footage are also inherently useful. I try to avoid using movies as a reference for a time and a place, because no matter how well researched that movie might have been, like any fiction, the creator may have taken some artistic license, which is completely understandable because ultimately movies are made for modern audiences. I don't always write my stories in a linear fashion, but I do outline the structure of them before I begin in broad terms. So that being said, I do make sure I have my characters defined first and foremost. What's their internal arc throughout the story? And then what's going to be the external arc or the thing that throws them together? Even if I don't have all the details for every scene hammered out. I find clearly defining the conflicts, internal and external, before I start writing allows me to keep pace and direction of the story. 
During the research phase at the beginning of each book, which entails lots and lots of reading and learning and note taking, I often find the inspiration for a particular scene that I imagine my character is embroiled in. So I'll often write that scene like right then and there, even if I'm not exactly sure where it'll fit, but because it furthers the character's own arc. When I'm ready to write, I have a very clear picture of how the story starts, how it will end, and the key scenes that will support the structure for the story. Each book I write is different in terms of the length of time it takes to write it. The research for each story is a huge part of the process, and that's measured in months and months. I try hard to get that part right before my characters start anything. I'm not a really quick writer, but I do try to achieve a word count each day and keep to a schedule based on that word count so I can hand a book into my editor when I've actually said I'm going to hand it in. I despise being late with anything. And The Paris Apartment took me about a year to write, beginning to end. The Paris Apartment was ultimately inspired by two real-life events that transfixed me immediately. Uh, the first being the discovery of the girl at Horde, which was the Munich apartment filled with artwork stolen by Nazis. The second was the discovery of an untouched Paris apartment abandoned by Madame de Florian Lee before the Nazi occupation and not discovered until after her death, 70 years later. The characters in this novel were inspired by the women of the SOE, the first women on the Western Front who were trained and sent into combat behind enemy lines. The Paris Apartment has dual narratives, a past narrative set during the occupation of Paris and a narrative set in the present. So my story starts in the present with Leah, a young professional who has unexpectedly inherited a Parisian apartment after her grandmother passes away. In this apartment that no one in her family knew anything about, Leah finds a virtual time capsule and a treasure trove of fine art, a huge collection of art, uh, fine furnishings, expensive gowns, uh, but most distressing to Leah is the Nazi propaganda that she finds, and that, combined with the untouched wealth and art, makes Leah believe that her grandmother may very well have been a Nazi collaborator. Along with the apartment, though, Leah's grandmother also leaves her a small, obscure painting by an unknowing artist that she seems to have valued above all others. That painting, Leah discovers, is connected to the family of Gabriel Seymour, a renowned art restorer based in London. Gabriel agrees to help Leah catalog and try to identify the art that she sure is stolen. And as they start examining the apartment in more detail, they're shocked at what else they find hidden behind the apartment's walls. Without giving away too many spoilers, the past narrative reveals an extraordinary, unlikely partnership between the two very different women who have taken two divergent approaches to the war. So Sophie Seymour, after suffering unspeakable heartbreak, turns to life as an English spy going deep undercover as the Allies seek critical intelligence for Operation Overlord. And Estelle Allard, Leah's grandmother, endures her own crippling grief, but joins the resistance and uses her socialite upbringing to manipulate the Nazi officers who occupy the Ritz Hotel. And what they end up accomplishing and the legacy that they leave behind is what Leah and Gabriel are left to discover and come face to face with in the end. People often ask me what my favorite book that I have written is, and I think I might have a different answer for every time I get asked that. I have favorite things in each book, and in some of my books, the characters exploded off the page, and it sounds totally cliched, but the story charged ahead and I literally couldn't write it fast enough. Uh, other stories were much harder to write, and there's the day that you delete 40,000 words because your story is just not heading the right way. Um, that's kind of a bittersweet moment because the way forward is certainly obvious now. But at the end, I can't say that the extra windy paths that I went down to finish those stories weren't just as rewarding as the clear track that I went on to finish another. Since I started writing, I've always had a World War II set novel in the back of my mind. Uh, both my grandfather served during the war and the conflict has always interested me. It was a true privilege to be able to research the stories of the real people who inspired this book and its characters. I loved every minute of writing The Paris Apartment for what it taught me and for what I was able to share. Occasionally I get asked for advice about getting a book published. Every published author has a different story about how they got to where they are, but they all have one thing in common. They wrote the book. Whatever you're writing, finish it, and then go ahead and write another. You can't improve on what doesn't exist, and you certainly can't sell it. So for me, all the novels I wrote before I finally published one were invaluable because they were practice. I also think you need to be able to listen to constructive criticism when it comes from a knowledgeable source. You certainly can't take that criticism personally, 
listen, evaluate, and see if you can apply it to make improvements. I went to university on an athletic scholarship, so I'm used to coaches constantly criticizing and correcting me. And it's never because they didn't like me, but because they wanted to make me the best I could be. So treat your writing like that. Tell your own story, but when you have a good team on your side that wants you to succeed, listen to what they have to say. Uh, when people ask me, uh, what do I want readers to take away from my novel, um, I generally back up a little bit to some of the family history that kind of uh, comes behind this novel. Uh, because I'm the resident history enthusiast in my family, I'm generally the recipient of old things that family members find when they're clearing out attics and basement. And as such, I have in my possession the war diary and letters of my great uncle, who fought in France during World War I. Uh, he was killed in action in 1918, but he left behind a very detailed account of his thoughts and his experiences during that time. And 22 years later, both my grandfathers would serve in World War II, and while they were lucky enough to make it home, they didn't keep a diary. Uh, nor did they speak at all about their experiences, not to their children and certainly not to their grandchildren. Uh, the subject was completely off limits and it was as if those years had never existed. Except, of course, they did exist. And even if my grandfather didn't speak of them directly, he did share his service with me in a way that I didn't recognize until I was much older. So by the time I was 10, I could read radio schematics and identify and solder the correct capacitor, resistor, or transistor into place. Uh, we rebuilt uh, a big 38 RCA Victor and then a pretty little 42 Northern Electric, um, and the latter which he presented to me for my 13th birthday. And I thought often about this contrast between my great uncle and my grandfather at the time when I sat down to write The Paris Apartment. What makes people choose to either share or keep private an experience that so drastically impacts their life? Uh, is it better to share an experience in detail with those left behind, the way my great uncle did? Uh, or is it better to leave the past completely sealed and maybe share only aptitude from those years, the way my grandfather did with me? So there's no right or wrong answer to any of those questions, and the characters in the Paris apartment uh, make their own choices for their own reasons. And for those who come behind, for those lucky enough to uncover the sacrifice and the courage of the generations before them, do those reasons matter? Um, so that question, and the answer that one might settle on, is what I'd like readers to take from the Paris apartment. Thanks for watching my book hour on Hey It's Carly Rae. You can check out my novel on my website or get in touch with me on social media. My links are in the description below. So that concludes today's Hey, It's Carly Rae Book Hour episode featuring Kelly Bowen. Kelly, thank you so much for coming on. I loved hearing your story and all about the Paris apartment. You guys need to get your copy. The link is in the description below of where you can get it because you can't have mine. I hope you guys enjoyed today's Book Hour episode. You guys can find out more from Kelly and me on social media. Again, all the links are in the description below. And on HeyIt'sCarlyRae.com, there is an exclusive interview with Kelly on there. How awesome is that? I hope you guys have an awesome day. Stay tuned. I have more authors coming your way. Have an awesome day!